Uh, welcome to the No BS debate featuring the candidates for City Council and District 8. Uh, we are your moderators. My name is De La Vaca. And I'm Sarah Ali. We want to thank the candidates for coming out to represent their communities. We also want to thank Denver Open Media, the Open, uh, Open Media Foundation, and Civic Matters for hosting this event. And lastly, we want to thank you, the audience, uh, for participating in the democratic process. So the debate rules are as follows. We, as your moderators, will ask each of our individual candidates questions on the topic of civil rights and other related topics. The candidate will each have one and a half minutes to answer, after which the other candidate will have an opportunity to rebut for one minute. The first candidate will have the opportunity to reply, and we encourage a lively debate, but we will interrupt if someone goes too long. This debate is slated for 50 minutes, and as we draw into the last five minutes, we will end the debate and push into the lightning round. At that time, candidates, you will be asked uh, close-ended questions, and you must answer with concise answers, a concise fashion about your position with either a yes, a no, or a pass. Denver City Council District 8 is in north, uh, northeast Denver, covering Park Hill, Stapleton, and portions of East Colfax and Montebello. Uh, now, let's have one and a half minute candidate introductions. We'll start here. Hello, my name is Patrick Thibault, and I'm a candidate for Denver City Council in District 8. And one of the things that gets me most excited about this opportunity is to represent the neighborhoods I grew up in. Grew up in a single parent home on the East Colfax Corridor, and I'm so grateful to have been raising the example of hard work and determination of a single mom. But most importantly, she taught me the uh, value of be a doer, not a talker. And that's what I've done throughout my professional career. And some of the things that make me confident that I can get to work day one for our District 8 neighborhoods is that I've worked to establish a permanent affordable housing fund statewide, passed uh, rental protections for victims of sexual assault and stalking, occupied a U.S. Senator's office for 36 hours in support of DACA and our DREAMers, and I've served for the past five years on the executive committee for NAACP Denver. And so I'm uh, very thankful to uh, be here tonight and I'm looking forward to the questions and um, thank you very much. Candidate Ruiz. Yeah, so my name is Miguel Ceballos Ruiz. Thank you so much for tuning in today and for hosting this. Um, I really do appreciate it. So I grew up in Northeast Denver um, and also my parents had a restaurant on East Colfax where you know, we had, we built community for many years. Um, if there's one thing that I'm running for city council, it's because I'm tired of the displacement of the working class from our city. Um, and this displacement um, disproportionately affects people of color the most. We've seen a mass displacement, a mass exodus of people who don't afford to live in the city no more. And with each person, with each family that leaves, uh, a valuable jewel leaves our city and I really feel that Denver has to start valuing the diversity that we have right now in order not to lose that. It's, uh, for me, it's what makes Denver such a wonderful and thriving place to live and it's what really is drawing a whole lot of people to our city right now. It's just the multi-color, um, multi-faceted, multi-cultural um, jewel and so that's why I'm running because I really feel that if we don't flip this around, if we don't turn around now, I, I'm fearful of what Denver will look like in a few years. And um, we have to challenge the way that the city has been growing. I'm not anti-growth, I actually welcome everyone who is moving here to the city. Uh, I was an immigrant once that was new to the city. You know, I was brand new and so I, I welcome you. However, you have to learn the history of the spaces you now occupy. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it should also be noted that there are six candidates running uh, for this seat. Uh, Lamone Knowles called in six today. Eric Penn, Blair Taylor, and our incumbent Chris Christopher Herndon were either unwilling or unable to attend. Mm -hmm. Now let's get into our questions. Mm -hmm. Question one, the topic is homelessness. So Denver will be voting on Initiative 300, an initiative to allow any individual to engage in activities such as resting and sheltering oneself in non-obstructive manner in an outdoor public place. The Right to Survive initiative is premised on protecting the homeless from 
city mandated property seizures and camping bans that leaves officers confiscating property in all kinds of weather conditions. This is a city authorized police action which leaves the unhoused facing any adverse health outcomes, including an up, an up to death, and which also deprives them of personal property. Do you support 300? If not, or if so, which other areas of our city resources should be mobilized to support our unhoused populations? Patrick. Um, yes, I do uh, support Initiative 300, and here's why. It's uh, almost for the same reasons why the opposition campaign has uh, titled, Because We Can Do Better. Well, the problem is, is I feel that we have not um, done better. We need uh, better temporary and permanent supportive housing, especially throughout uh, District 8. Um, you, you often hear uh, a lot of scare tactics uh, from, from the other side. Um, one of them specifically being is that this bill uh, does not um, create uh, any new beds. Well, I, I push back and ask uh, how many beds has the camping ordinance directly uh, contributed and how much funds is it uh, contributed to our most vulnerable populations? And that answer is zero. Uh, another uh, big um, uh, uh, opposition that you hear is that it's um, going to, or that it's poorly written. Well, the thing is, that's one of the beauties of uh, Denver and in Colorado is we have the ability uh, as citizens to uh, engage in the legislative process and get things onto the ballot. Um, but this particular issue should have uh, been spearheaded and we should have had the leadership from our elected officials. And uh, so, um, it's going to be uh, poorly written because average folks don't know how to define uh, complex legal language into our state statute. And that's why I want to make sure that we actually put forward solid solutions on this issue. Kendra Lewis. You know, for me, the reason that there's so much homelessness and an increase in homelessness in Denver is because of the cost of living. Denver is extremely expensive to live. And so if we tackle that first, um, you know, I think would be the right thing to do, but unfortunately Denver decided to put a camping ban in place first to criminalize the homelessness. Um, and we know how criminalization works. We've seen it in communities of color. It is a civil rights matter. If you give someone a ticket and they don't, and they're not able to make it to court, what happens then? They get a bench warrant and they spend the night in jail. And who spends money? The city. It is a, a complete waste of resources. So yes, I will be voting in favor of Initiative 300, and I'm also in favor of overturning the current camping ban, and city council should take the initiative uh, and you know, reverse that this week. That's what they could do immediately. Um, our current incumbent is not in favor of uh, Initiative 300. He is not in favor of overturning the camping ban, uh, and I'm in favor of overturning that for sure. Mr. Tybalt, any reply or additional comments? Uh, yes. So, um, yeah, actually, uh, I uh, have had uh, a personal relationship with this issue for uh, a long time. Uh, one of my, actually, one of my best friends. Uh, and so was when she was uh, um, in law school uh, up in Boulder. That's where actually where the uh, camping ordinance started. She uh, represented the individual who received the first uh, camping ordinance infraction, and the outcome of that case was failure uh, to appear. And so um, because of that, and because of uh, issues like the camping ordinance, it does further perpetuate um, involvement within the criminal justice system. And a lot of times we are uh, releasing folks back into the public after short terms in jail, uh, worse off than they already are. Could be missing work, could be missing out on medications, could be missing out on uh, community support systems like, like AA. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that this is a really important discussion that we need to continuously have and actually need um, good, solid traction for our community. Our second question will be for candidate uh, Ruiz. Racial equality and equity remain a nationwide concern. A few facts. Colorado had the most extensive KKK networks west of the Mississippi through the 1930s. The grandson of one ran for governor this past year. Mm -hmm. One neighborhood and the airport are still named after him. And that's Stapleton. 
Educational equity has failed children of color based on zip code. Gentrification continues unabated. According to the Denver Gentrification Study in 2016, gentrification is premised on a view of space as profit margin, not community. The Colorado Trust tied historic segregation to modern gentrification. Addressing the racial wealth gap in Colorado, they said, the latest view of racial and income inequality in the U.S. shows deep and entrenched disparities along racial lines. How does it play out in Colorado? Not well. Across a range of measures, Colorado was failing to provide equitable opportunities across racial lines. Colorado was third in the nation for white supremacist propaganda. White terrorist and right-wing violence are the biggest threat to Americans, yet people of color suffer the brunt of policing. Across this range of issues around racial equity, what are your thoughts on racial equity and equality and how will you work to move District 8 uh, and by extension the state of Colorado uh, towards a more equal and equitable future? Yeah. So I see the displacement of communities of color as one of the greatest injustices that is going on in Denver right now. Um, you know, I grew up in Montbello during a time that was a really hard time for our community. We went through a wave of violence in the 90s. The 80s were full of violence as well. Um, and we made it out of that. And the reason that we made it out of that was because the community came together and decided that we were gonna have a change within our neighborhoods. And we put in the hard work, the long hours, and it was us. We're the ones who, who changed um, our communities and made them beautiful, thriving places to live. And now that we have reached this point in which our communities are desirable, we no longer afford to live there. That is unjust. And it is really clear that there's underlying inequities and systems in place that are pr propagating this, of course, that are pushing this forward. Um, and what are we going to do as a city in order to overturn and to undo a lot of this? So I really believe in affordable housing, I'm sorry, in affirmative action policies and housing. I think that that's what we need to be pursuing in Denver, equity, right? Um, and so I believe that we should have a really rigid and strong um, in investment program back into the communities in the following way. So I believe that our down payment assistance programs should be increased from 4% to 10%. And we should make it easier for people to apply to those programs. Right now, we don't have the type of, comp the type of uh, funds to compete with people coming in from out of town to put down on a home. And so we could do a lot as a city to level that off, to, to, e to bring equity to that. Could you uh, just repeat the specific question one more time for me? What are your thoughts on racial equality and equity, and how will you work to move District 8 and, by extension, Colorado towards a more equal and equitable future? Yeah, this um, working around equity specifically has been uh, what I've done with my uh, community advocacy work um, now for years. Uh, I've uh, served as the political action chair for NAACP Denver uh, for the past five years and um, through that work I've uh, tried to um, create the space and the programming for the community to engage on the specific issues that are uh, affecting our um, neighborhoods in uh, near Northeast and Northeast Denver. Um, also uh, make sure that the uh, elected officials are, are coming to them. Um, I think that that is uh, a really important thing in near Northeast and uh, Northeast Denver is that um, we can't just have uh, elected officials that either don't show up or only show up around election time. And, but uh, most specifically is we have to uh, continuously work to uh, make sure we're incorporating as many voices in our legislative decision-making process as possible. <clears throat> you know, in this, right now in Denver, this really has to be said. Um, we do have a lot of people of color who are in elected office right now. And despite that, they haven't been fighting for us. We have been seeing this forced displacement in our communities, and it, it's really reached a tipping point. Um, and I believe it's time that we say this. Um, just because someone is a person of color doesn't mean that they're fighting for the communities of color. Mm -hmm. um, and some elected officials that are in office right now have been selling our communities out, one rezoning at a time. I will be the city council member that actually does the right thing and fights to stop the further displacement of our people. Uh, we had an audience question. Regarding uh, Donald Trump's threat to send undocumented immigrants to sanctuary cities, uh, as city council members, would you join uh, other cities across the country 
in uh, declaring that we welcome uh, immigrants and undocumented immigrants uh, to Denver? Y yes, um, I think that, and here, here's what gets me so frustrated is that um, I'm so tired of our, um, our immigrant populations uh, being treated like a political football. Um, I don't think that that has, um, that doesn't do anybody justice. And we, uh, we're still trying to uh, work to make sure that our, our Dreamers and DACA actually have its own specific time on uh, the legislative floor and gets, gets its debate so we can actually work on comprehensive uh, immigration reform. If you were to uh, take a poll of uh, current legislators you know, in Washington, D.C., um, this is something that they, they want to do and what we need to work on. And um, the leadership from the executive office, again, just uh, treating people, again, like um, a political football, is not how we bring uh, folks together and doesn't create an inclusive America. Yeah. You know, I was brought here as a baby. So before my second birthday, my parents um, came here. And the first neighborhood that we lived in was in the Baker neighborhood. So yes, I do believe that we should um, declare that we welcome immigrants to Denver. However, uh, more meaningful than that, I believe that we should make Denver a place where uh, working class immigrants actually afford to live. And that's where our greatest failure under um, the last seven years um, in this council member's uh, tenure has been, right? We don't afford to live in the great communities we have built. Uh, and, and that's where I want to attack it. That's where I want to attack the injustice, uh, is to actually build a society where we could remain in these communities that we have built. I think that's where it starts. So our next question, April is sexual Assault Awareness Month. One in five women and one in 71 men in the United States has been raped at some point in their lives. 42% of victims experienced their first completed rape before the age of 18. A 2016 survey found that 28% of CU Boulder's female undergrads had been sexually assaulted CU is in the news now for a recent rape. Denver's DA, Beth McCann, was found in 2018 to have prosecuted 33% of rape cases, a small improvement over her predecessor's average of 30%. The Denver Post Rape Tracker shows that Denver has had 122 rapes reported so far this year. That's an average of 38.2 per month. 1.3 per day. The most rapes any neighborhood in Denver has had this year is in five points with nine. Mm -hmm. The average number of rapes per neighborhood this year is 1.56. How will you use your seat on the council to address these issues and make Colorado a safer place for women and female ident identified bodies? Yeah. That's extremely sad to, to hear and, and it's extremely concerning um, that it's going on in, in Denver right now. Um, I have pushed back on Beth McCann's leadership um, and I have you know, pushed in, in circumstances that I believe they, they didn't make the correct choice. Um, in Montbello, we had a murder in which Aurora police came in uh, and killed someone um, down the street from where I live. Um, and Beth McCann had a, a meeting out there in East, in Montbello. Um, and I, I asked her publicly to revisit that decision that no charges were filed against that police officer. Um, you know, and so I have a track record of, of pushing back and I would really ask to sit, you know, to sit down with Beth McCann um, and ask how we, what we could do together as a city, right? Uh, me as a council member and her as a DA in order to make our city safer. We, we absolutely do need to have better policies in place if those are the statistics. Um, and I think that it, be, it begins with believing accusers um, and not making them feel that they're doing the wrong thing by coming forward. We should be encouraging that. We need to have a whole lot of education in our communities uh, about consent. Um, so it, a lot of youths haven't had that, you know, so modernizing our, um, our sexual uh, education in classrooms and letting kids know what consent is and what it isn't. Um, I know at DU also it's an issue. Um, there's a lot of people who 
you know, who have been assaulted at, at, at DU, and that's within Denver's boundaries. So we absolutely have to do better. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I'm proud to uh, say that this is something that I have uh, specifically worked on at the legislative level. Um, as I mentioned in uh, my opening, as a chief of staff for both uh, state senator and state representative, um, specifically with uh, Representative Dominique Jackson and um, Colorado Coalition Against uh, Sexual Assault, um, we were able to pass um, better rental protections for victims of sexual assault and stalking. During, that, uh, during those stakeholder processes, um, I heard uh, just, uh, just heart-wrenching stories uh, about um, victims who uh, a lot of times were um, the uh, perpetrators of the violence were landlords or someone living in the building. And we're discussing <coughs> how hard it is to uh, move um, just as uh, just just folks w with without being in these situations, but just think if um, you had to put a, a safety plan in place and you, you weren't able to uh, uh, put um, first and last month's rent into a um, into a new uh, place and so that's why I was uh, very excited to uh, work on that initiative but some of the things that we specifically have to do is um, we have to uh, we have to find um, a good working relationship between our system based and our community based um, outlets to report um, sexual violence and I wish I could continue on with that thought. Okay. <laughs> Thank you Patrick. Do you have a rebuttal? No. You know, I heard a little bit about uh, Assemblywoman Jackson's efforts and that she tasked you with. Um, I wouldn't say those are your efforts, right? I would say those are her efforts that you help with. And I'm wondering what other individual things you believe we should do in the city. Uh, and as a follow-up uh, for candidate Ruiz, yeah. we talked about the police a little bit and about Beth McCann. I didn't hear anything about specifically the police, mm. right? What protocols are in place for police uh, or oversight that the council can provide in situations where police officers are known to tell women uh, or ask them, what were you doing there? How much did you drink? Are you sure that's what happened? Right? Start by believing, yes, but mm -hmm. who, who needs to start by believing if the failure is in the evidenti uh, evidentiary train uh, that is derailed before it gets to Beth McCann? No, yeah, absolutely. And so that, that does take a re, you know, a shift in culture within the police community, uh, the poli our service members in the police force. Um, and, you know, as a board member of the Colorado Latino Forum, um, I did help push to create a new, um, you know, a new use of force policy. But we needed, we needed to create that um, and push for criminal justice reform um, on many more levels than just the use of force policy. And so I really believe that we need to have an open conversation about this specific topic. What, why is only 33% of people committing these crimes being prosecuted? Um, I really believe that uh, the, the, we have the, the duty to, to look at that next, for, for sure. So I think uh, I just kind of want to touch on some of the things that I was uh, talking about earlier. Um, I think it's the, the um, conversation between remedies between uh, system-based. Uh, um, what I mean by system-based is a, a victim, victim having to go through uh, law enforcement. There's also out there is um, commu uh, community-based um, organizations and advocates that um, help victims uh, through this process. A lot of times um, our law enforcement officers are looking to uh, just catch the perpetrator and not actually um, embrace the experience uh, of the victim. And I think that that's what a vital piece of the conversation that um, our community-based um, organizations and uh, systems allow uh, victims. There's also, um, in, in some instances, uh, victims may not want to uh, prosecute out of uh, further fear of uh, uh, further violence, or it might um, potentially uh, damage a, a family situation. Kids might have to move into uh, foster uh, situations, and so I think that um, we really need to um, highlight both of those uh, avenues. I think the advocate's point is a very good one. Uh, I used to work at the Blue Bench, yep. and uh, we trained on community advocates, uh, working with SANE nurses, and following uh, the victim or the survivor through the entire process and dealing with the police and that kind of stuff. Uh, it is important, 
uh, that we start with believing, but we need to have a lot more ideas for the whole path uh, mm -hmm. from, I mean, why men are able to do this and get away with it, all the way to how, how they survive. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, this is on community wellness. Community wellness. Uh, according to denverpublichealth.org city council district report for district eight, mm. uh, life expectancy in your district is 79.7 years, 1.1 years longer than Denver overall. Uh, differences in life expectancy between districts show that place matters. Community policies that address health equity uh, all play important roles in improving health for residents. 18% uh, of uh, District 8 young adults from 18 to 24 years old use tobacco, which is 1% higher than Denver overall. 10% of public school children aged 2 through 17 uh, are obese, which is 6% lower than Denver overall. Uh, and 14% of the adults uh, in your district have been diagnosed with depression, uh, which is 1% higher than the average, which is 13% for Denver. Uh, Denver.gov states, uh, the health of a community depends on more than access to health care. Healthy communities are composed of our physical environment, healthy opportunities, support, and where individuals easily connect with community partners, uh, healthy food systems, and also with safe environments. Increased access to these items allows individuals of a healthy community to thrive and for communities that aren't healthy to be healthier. Uh, do you believe that your district is serving its community equitably in these areas? And if not, what will you do to address disparities in the district? And we'll start with Mr. Thibault. 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 That's exactly so, right. So um, I think the uh, big thing with uh, healthy, healthy neighborhoods uh, is, a, is a dovetail into um, how the housing, transportation, a lot of the issues that, that we're discussing. Um, I personally, um, I have to shop outside of the district because there aren't any close uh, uh, grocery options uh, near where I live in, in the district. If I didn't want to use single occupant car to get to a grocery store in the district, if I wanted to use bus, it would take me um, uh, 45 minutes to an hour because I'd have to transfer buses to get there. So we really have to be thinking um, what um, wellness and healthy lifestyles looks like for working families, and especially in housing. It's not just two and three bedroom options, but what are the amenities in, uh, in place for families? What are, what are the uh, walkable amenities in hospitality? How close are you to fixed transit? These are real conversations that we need to be uh, having as we're trying to create inclusive housing throughout um, not only city, but in specifically District 8. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, there, there is not a lot of equity in that. Those numbers sound great, but if we break them down and we start looking at, um, looking at the income, right, if we break that down by income, it, it's true. And I suspect um, that those numbers would come out to be that people who have less of an income are unhealthier. In Montbello, Southwestern Montbello, the part of District 8, there is no grocery store option. There is no healthy food option. Um, it is still a registered food desert because it's more than a mile away from the closest grocery store. And, you know, there is an organization that I'm a board member of named the Montbello Organizing Committee who's working to bring a black-owned healthy food store to that part of Montbello and help al alleviate that problem. But this is also the case in, in Northeast Park Hill and also, um, you know, where Patrick lives and along Colfax. Um, and so, no, we do not have equity. Right now, also, another huge problem that we're going to be facing is they're going to be digging up two Superfund sites to build the I-70 Central project. What is the city going to do to keep the residents safe through that construction? Um, they're going to be putting all these contaminants, pollutants, carcinogens into the air. Is the city doing anything to protect us? Also, we're building communities next to toxic waste dumps in Stapleton, right next to the arsenal. So is the city continuously monitoring radiation? What are they doing on that front? So health is more than numbers, and I really believe that we have to be on top of that for sure. Really quick, did you want to reply? That was your question to start, and then we have a follow-up from, uh, from the web. I'm sure. No, I'm happy to take the question from the web. Great. So the area surrounding I-70 and Swan Swansea and El Rey Lyria. Oh, oh, <laughs> El Rey and Glo Globe Globeville encompasses the most toxic U.S. zip code. Um, 
where some families have reported multi-generation effects from living on a highway and in a super fun site. Mm -hmm. The EPA Community Advisory Group contends that remediation of the Vasquez I-70 super, super fun site is incomplete and that the EPA is seeking to prematurely remove the site from the national priorities list of Superfund sites. What do you think the response should be? I think specifically for, um, we, there's not the, uh, and not just with um, our Superfund sites, but we're seeing actually uh, on different projects throughout uh, Denver is that we're not doing the, the proper soils mitigations, especially in the most toxic um, zip code, you know, in our city, in, in uh, the country, we, um, we're going to be uh, doing a, a lot of uh, subterranean work and we're going to be bringing a lot of things into the surface and then outward into uh, the community. So that uh, first step of making sure that we have the, the proper soils mitigations is uh, vitally important. We also have to make sure 80218 is not, um, is not a popular dumping ground uh, for um, heavy industry. I think, and especially uh, in um, sites that are close proximity to uh, generational neighborhoods as well. Mm -hmm. No, and so I was one of the leading uh, proponents, one of the leading voices in favor of rerouting I-70. Um, and I was opposed to this I-70 ditch project from the beginning. Um, it was done in a really unjust and dishonest way. We, that highway should still be rerouted through the 270 route. Um, Globrial area Swansea is a neighborhood that is 80% Latino and the residents of that area suffer from a whole lot more respiratory illnesses because of that highway going through their backyard. Um, you know, so I think that is not too late to, to change this. Uh, Governor Polis promised um, that he would revisit the decision and so I urge anyone who is listening to, you know, send him an email. Where, where is that? Where did that disappear after he got elected? Um, you know, a lot of us sat down with him <clears throat> and asked him personally, and he said that, yeah, he would revisit that and see, really honestly look into rerouting uh, I-70 through the 270 route. Um, it's unjust. We have the opportunity to get rid of this uh, highway and, and push it out of Denver, and that's what we should still be talking about right now. Move on to the next question. A topic near our hearts as media professionals. Media is in crisis in Colorado. Denver Open Media is under attack. Mm. As Mayor Hancock has worked to defund this important project and remove equipment. The Denver Post and the Daily Camera, our region's only two major print newspapers, are owned by hedge funds who are busy extracting capital and laying off staff. Fake news is the slur of the day, thanks to our president. How do we support our local newspapers, community journalism, and organizations like Denver Open Media that work to be a pillar in our community and for, for information and provide equal access to everyone? You know, absolutely. We should be subs directly subsidizing your efforts, mm -hmm. right? As a city, we, the more information that's out there, the healthier democracy is gonna be, the more participation um, in our democracy we're going to have. One of the things that I'm struggling with right now as a candidate is the fact that historically we have such low voter turnout in municipal elections. Um, and so just even um, even notifying people that there's an election, even in just informing them, is taking up so much of my time um, that I believe that the media should definitely uh, be more in a, in a better robust place to be able to help us move our democracy towards a better place. and that's. That's direct, and that's why you know both me and Patrick are here today to support you because, of course, right? We see the value in having more discussion and more and more um, opinions and and different points of view. You know, we don't always uh, agree on everything, even though we're a city full of, of good liberals, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to have that discussion at the forefront for sure. Mm -hmm. So number one, um, come and take a class down here at, at Denver Open Media. I, I actually, um, I remember back in 2014, I took a, a, a free Dreamweaver class uh, down here. Um, and just the, the resources and the fantastic um, resources that you all provide, especially through uh, the community education, is so vital 
um, especially uh, when we're, um, what you do with those classes, you're providing um, a void for someone who um, may not have the time or the resources to go right back um, into college or uh, get some professional certifications and you're providing a, a step stone uh, towards that. But also, yeah, like Miguel said, we need to do a, a better job of making sure that you all can keep the lights on. Don't kill Big Bird. Let's get, mm -hmm. P let's get PBS as well. Um, so yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a huge supporter of uh, community t television and radio, regular listener, listener to uh, KGNU. And um, if uh, watch the programming, be a part, and uh, give money when you can. Uh, just to follow up, you're the first candidate, uh, Mr. Ruiz, to bring up uh, pub public subsidies for uh, news agencies. And I, I think that's important because it, it is a solution. Uh, somebody earlier uh, was against that idea while suggesting that uh, newspapers are like a public utility, mm -hmm. uh, which are oftentimes subsidized. Now, follow-up question. Rather than renew support for public access media in 2018, Denver's Department of Marketing and Media Services under Mayor Hancock removed control of Denver's three public access television stations to the city, resulting in the city co-opting control of media and content from the public. Government control of the only public TV forum for free expression and dissent compromises First Amendment rights of the people. Access to equipment, facilities, and classes by the public has been greatly diminished since the city has removed much of the video broadcast equipment uh, from Denver Open Media. Is mayoral control of public access media another example mm -hmm. of power overreach by the mayor's office? We'll go here. Yeah, so absolutely, you know, um, I do believe that we should have a strong council system in Denver. Um, and as a city council member, I would be working to take some power away from our mayor. Like our mayor has way too much power. We've seen it over and over again. That decision was the wrong decision. Um, and as a city council member, I'll be doing everything that I can in order to reverse that, right? And that's the status, that's the state of our democracy here locally in Denver. You know, people talk about what's going on nationally, um, and we are being gaslighted by our president, but what's going on here in Denver, right? We're not all that far away from that either. If we're publicly, if we're attacking our, you know, our public sources of information, then I believe we failed as a city, and we should reverse course and correct that, definitely. Um, so could you, could you repeat Is that mayoral last control one more time? of public access media another example of power overreach by the mayor's office? Yes, um, we, we are too uh, top heavy you know, within our Denver municipal government. Um, uh, a lot of times if you uh, will ask uh, a current council person, you know, a lot of times if um, the community uh, wants a different result than uh, the mayor's agenda, city council will just say, oh, our, ha our hands are tied. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I mean, uh, city council is an important um, piece to our municipal legislative process, and we need to have um, a healthy, healthy discourse between our executive branch at the municipal level and our city council, uh, because if if you're just kicking your feet up on the desk and waiting, waiting for decrees from the mayor, we're actually not um, we're actually not having any progress, and that's why we need um, strong council um, folks, you know, at the city and county building to make sure that we're they're actually spearheading efforts and leading the charge on efforts in coordination uh, with the mayor's office. And again, not just sitting and waiting uh, to uh, work on things that are from the mayor's office. One last follow-up for Mr. Ruiz. Uh, you called us a city full of liberals, good liberals, mm. um, which <laughs> I don't think is a, is, a, is a false statement. At the same time, you were one of three candidates uh, yeah. endorsed by Denver Socialists for DSA. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. um, Listen, so I was uh, one of the six people who ran the Colorado Democratic Party, and we helped reform under Morgan Carroll's leadership of the party and make it an open, inclusive, and welcoming party. Um, and that led to our great victories in 2018. We really changed the culture. Um, you know, we had uh, the reputation of being this party that made decisions in, in back smoke-filled rooms. Um, and I don't think that that was, you know, completely inaccurate. Uh, you know, I do believe that as a city, we should be taking care of people rather than corporations. Uh, and so, yeah, I am extremely proud to have been, uh, to earn the endorsement of the Democratic Socialists of America. And I am a good social democrat, right? I believe that 
the model it needs to be changed. Um, a lot of our labor is being exploited, um, and we definitely need to revisit um, the equity that we could build as a city. So I am in favor of rent controls. I think that rent should only be allowed to um, increase a certain percentage every year. I am in favor of a living wage in Denver, way more than $15 an hour for city workers. Most city workers were already m doing that. That's obvious that that move by the mayor's office was a campaign ploy. Um, and so, you know, we need to extend that to every worker in the city and county of Denver in an equitable way and go beyond that. Excellent. Yeah. I know that question was directly for Mr. Ruiz, but if you want to identify as a, where you are on the political spectrum and how you feel about social democracy. Um, I've, I've been uh, a lifelong Democrat, you know, ever, ever since I was able to uh, register to vote at 18. I've, I've had a D behind my name. Um, uh, specifically with the, uh, so I guess, yeah, I um, fall along the uh, progressive uh, political persuasion as well. And um, the thing for me is uh, when we're, so uh, a lot of things that we're, we're talking about um, that are, are labeled as uh, a socialist political persuasion, uh, for me, the, uh, taking care of folks, making sure that the, the least uh, among your community is uplifted as well were values that I was raised with. It's not something that I uh, adopted along the way through uh, political discussion, but these are values um, that I was raised with and making sure that um, I'm always going to use my time, talent, and to make sure that we're able to uh, uplift all voices and bodies in our community. Did you have a follow-up? Well, the only thing that I would add to that is that as a city, we have um, heavily subsidized corporations, and we've given away a lot of money, um, and we have followed that model of corporate welfare in Denver, and it's something that we really need to step up and snap out of, um, and that's the type of city council member that, that I will be. I'll be a city council member that builds up our people and allows our people to actually afford to live in Denver, not only corporations, right, uh, or huge huge companies and LLCs. Gentlemen, it's time for the lightning round. Yes. All right. So first, Denver is unveiling a new transportation department to supersede RTD in, in the city. Are you for or against? Patrick. Yes, but I wish I could talk about that more. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Transition Denver to fully renewables by 2030 or face extin extinction as a species. Uh, yes or no? Yes. Yes. The Psilocybin Initiative. Legalize mushrooms? Decriminalize mushrooms. That's my fault. Decriminalize mushrooms, yes or no? Oh, I wish I could talk more about that. Um, I believe in decriminalizing all drugs, so yes. 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 Uh, State Representative Julie Gonzalez has proposed removing the ban against rent control to allow cities to decide for themselves what, work be uh, what works best. Support rent control in Denver, yes or no? Yes. Yes, thanks, Julie. Do you support deferred action for childhood arrivals, DACA? Yes or no? Patrick. Yes, yes I do, and the parents as well, DAPA. The Olympics initiative, for or against? Oh, no Olympics. No. So, no Olympics, and that means yes on 302, right? <laughs> so, yes on it, yeah. and no on it. Or, so, uh, so, I'm not in favor of the Olympics, so I'm not. Okay. So yes. 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 <laughs> yes <Sorry>. means no. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah. It's the way that, it's the way it's worded. Right. right. April tenth was Equal Pay Day. The Equal Pay for Equal Work Act was recently heard in committee. Do you support a law to ensure equal pay? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Ban fracking in Colorado. Yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. There's an organization advocating for renaming public spaces that honor Denver's former mayor, Benjamin Stapleton, who was a member, supporter, and agent of the Ku Klux Klan. Rename Stapleton, yes or no? Do that yesterday, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Uh, and finally, ending with some very important geopolitical intrigue. Gentlemen, uh, who's gonna win the Game of Thrones? Oh my goodness. Any idea? Be careful with this answer, no, you guys. Be careful. <laughs> this will get you voted out. I don't want to make on. anyone mad about Game of Thrones, so <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no comment? The dragons. The dragons <laughs> win. The dragons, <laughs> oh, I love it. Great, great. Uh, at this point, 
Gentlemen, uh, we would like to ask you for one and a half minutes of closing statements. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe we began with Patrick, so we'll mm -hmm. start this time with Mr. Ruiz. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, Denver is, you know, it's not on the right path right now. Um, our elected officials are telling us right now that everything is fine and dandy. Everything is just honky-dory. Absolutely not. There's been a lot of us who've been left behind by the rising tide. If you look at who was forced to leave out of our city, um, there's a lot of us who would love to live in Denver. Believe me, the black and brown community and our cultural jewels, um, there's no reason that we wanted to leave that. But it's a matter of fact. It's, it's an unjust system of displacement that we have in place right now. And that's what I want to really focus on as your city council member. A Denver that does not include people of color is just a Denver, a Denver that I'm not going to sit idly by and allow to happen. So I welcome your vote this May uh, 7th. You can start voting right now, actually. Um, you probably have a ballot on the way to your house. Um, my name is Miguel A. Adrian Ceballos Ruiz. Miguel Adrian Ceballos Ruiz. My whole name's on the ballot, right? Um, and my website is miguelfordenver.com. Uh, I please welcome um, your communication um, and your added um, involvement in this municipal election. Thank you so much. It, thank you, uh, thank you for um, having us um, here this evening, and thanks for watching and listening um, at home or in your cars. Uh, this this election is is really important, um, especially uh, about the direction that we're going to uh, pursue as a city. Um, there are many voices uh, that feel that they don't, um, that Denver's not welcome uh, to them anymore. And so speci uh, specifically in the neighborhoods I grew up in, you could uh, use to, the neighborhood character is that you could find every walk of life, race, creed, gender, background, all living on one block, and we're losing that identity. And we need to preserve that neighborhood history and culture, which is unique through, throughout our city. We can't just squeeze round pegs in, into uh, square holes just to satisfy the conversation of development. We need to be conscious of these things. And I'm always going to be working for the voices in um, our community because before I ever came to ask you for your vote, I came to ask you, are you registered to vote? Did you get your ballot in? Can you come to this community meeting? And so I'm going to uh, continue uh, my work as a, as a council person um, to ensure that we're able to uh, keep our community uh, voices strong within the decision-making process for District 8. I'd be honored to uh, have your support uh, on or before May 7th, and my website is Patrick, the number four, denver.com. Thank you, Patrick and Miguel. Thank you so much for being here and addressing these questions for the public. We wish you the best, both of you, with your races uh, and for, for your campaigns. We really want to thank the audience for being here tonight, and we'd really like to thank Denver Open Media and the Open Media Foundation and Civic Matters for hosting this event. I hope that you all have learned and gleaned some information here that has set you up for the elections that are upcoming. Thank you so much again for joining us for the No BS Debates. I'm Sarah Ali. And I'm De La Vaca. Have a good night.